about um, a topic we find here in verses uh, 14 down to verse 16. It is a, it's a concept that's mentioned several times in the New Testament and a, a lot of examples in the Old Testament, and it's one we don't talk about a lot. I mentioned before, as you look at lists uh, throughout the Bible, there tends to be one item in the list that always seems a bit out of the place. One of those things you think, ah, oh, I'm on board with all of these ones, but I don't see how this one really fits in. And this is one of those things that pops up in lists from time to time uh, throughout the Bible that I want to talk about this morning. We'll look here in, in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verses 14 down to verse 16. Paul writes, Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as light from the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. This is one of those things that's easy to say, maybe a lot harder to do. He states very plainly, very openly, do all things without grumbling or disputing. And then he tacks on some reasons in verse 15 that you may be blameless and innocent. Obviously, the implication here in verse 14 is that whenever we grumble or whenever we dispute, we become a lot less blameless and a lot less innocent. He, calls, he tells us that we need to not grumble or dispute so that we can become children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Now, the implication, again, being that grumbling is going to taint us inside of this twisted generation. And then he tells us we need to shine as lights in this world. And I want us to think just for a moment, who do you know that grumbles and complains a lot about life? Would you view them as somebody who is salt or somebody who is light? Or do you see that their light is being dimmed by their grumbling? Disputing. He told us, tells us here in verse 16, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ may be proud that I did not run or labor in vain. Again, it seems like there's an implication that the more that we grumble, the more that we dispute, the less we hold fast to the word of life. And we'll look at some of these reasons a little bit later on. But turn over with me. Uh, over to 1 Peter chapter 4 and in verse 9. Well, Paul makes a pretty broad statement to do all things without grumbling or disputing. Peter is a bit more specific um, here in verse 9. Not that Peter doesn't want you to grumble and complain about other things. It's just that he has a very specific purpose here in verse 9. He tells us to show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Again, very simple, plain statement. And you wonder, well, why is it that he tells you show hospitality without grumbling or complaining? Well, hospitality is one of those things we, we have a lot of sayings about already, that fish and company begin to stink after three days. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency that, you know, whenever we are around people, we are kind of on, meaning that we, 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 pay attention, we are attentive to their needs, we pay attention to them, we listen to their conversation. We are a little bit less at ease around other people. And then when we go home, we don't have to wear all the nice clothes, we can wear comfy clothes. Uh, we don't have to do all the makeup that Jake normally puts on. We just get to you know, be our normal self. You know, we are a lot more comfortable in our own home, in our own domain. And whenever you invite people in to stay with you for an extended time period, that tends to begin to wear on you. And what begins as generosity and kindness begun to be an obligation, and we begin to resent over time. That's a general tendency for us. So Peter tells us we need to show hospitality without grumbling or complaining. And that even in areas where you know, we would rather not, he tells us to do it anyways. Now we'll look at two, two examples uh, for this. One is in Jude chapter 1. By the way, the only chapter in Jude, if you're super curious. Uh, Jude chapter 1, and we're going to look, um, starting there, let's go ahead and start back in verse 14. He says, it's about these 
that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all of ungodly, all the ungodly of all their deeds and ungodliness that they have committed in such ungodly ways. For all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against them, these are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. He mentions you know, this is a prophecy from Enoch, which we know almost nothing about, other than he makes the point that the Lord will come with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment against these people who, and then he goes into this long list of ungodliness, that all the ungodly and all of their ungodly ways and the which they committed in their ungodly deeds. And then he mentions who these people are in verse 16. They are grumblers. And you're expecting a bit more than that, probably, if you're, if you're honest with yourself. You're, you're expecting a bit more, like, all of these ungodly people who come in and they are child harassers. Uh, they are murderers. They are insurrectionists. And the answer is not that it's grumblers, malcontents, people who follow their own sinful desires, loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. You know, one of those things you think, ah, oh, that seems a bit harsh. Because we view grumbling and complaining as just, well, I'm just getting off my chest. I'm just expressing my own feelings. And yet, this isn't at all what we are called to do as Christians. I want to look at one more passage over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He gets into a longer discourse in chapter 10 over idolatry. And he draws... In verses 1 through 10 on the example from, or the examples from the Old Testament. And he begins there in verse 1, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And then you know, the analogy that he makes in verse 2 is that they too, like us, were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And then they all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And so he makes the analogy for us as Christians, all of us have been baptized, all of us to partake in the Lord's Supper on a weekly basis, we're all in this same boat. But nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So if you think the rituals of being baptized and eating the Lord's Supper is going to be enough to make you okay in God's eyes. He says that isn't the case. So starting here in verse 6, Now these things took place as an example for us, that we may not desire evil as they did. Do not be idol idolaters, as some of them were. And as is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And we're kind of tracking up to verse 9. We don't want to be idolaters. We don't be, want to be idol idolaters. And we don't want to be individuals who put Christ to the test. And then verse 10 comes in, which is the one that's kind of on the list that we aren't quite sure about. Or grumblers, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happen to them as an example, but they're written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stand take heed, lest he fall. On the list of huge sins that happened during the time period of the wandering in the wilderness, you think of them sitting down to eat and drink and then arising to play and worship at the feet of this golden calf of David. You think of the sexual morality that was seemed to be pretty uh, rampant through the camp, and 23,000 fell in one day over that as well. You think, okay, these people were doing just terrible, terrible things, and then he mentions in verse 10 that they grumbled and were destroyed by the destroyer. 
And you can hear all of the grumblings uh, from that time period. Oh, Moses, you brought us out to the sea that we may be drowned in the sea. You know, oh, that we only we were back in Egypt uh, as slaves and we could have leaks that we really want to have leaks. I don't know why people would want to be back in slavery for leaks. I haven't figured that one out yet. Uh, but we'll pass over that one for now. So you think about all the grumbling that happened. That you brought us out here to, to die of starvation. You brought us out here to not have water. And after all the miracles, after all that God has done for them, of them being free and being led directly to a land of promise, of grumbling and complaining the whole way. And he lists that in the list of the things that we are to learn from so that we don't desire evil like they did. And I want us to consider just for a, a few moments this morning, what are some of the problems with grumbling? What is it that, that we are saying whenever we grumble and complain about our lot in life? I would suggest that we call God unjust in his actions and his choices. Romans chapter 9 Paul asked the rhetorical question there in verse 21. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Doesn't God have right over our lives to shape and mold us the way that we ought to be? And yet whenever we grumble and complain about our life, you know, aren't we really saying back to God that he's unjust in his actions, that he, that we don't, that he isn't right in making the choices that he's made for us? I mean, that's what the Israelites did. Now, why would God bring me out here this is not the right choice to make? We also tend to be people who claim that what we're going through is undeserved. And I wasn't sure how far I was. Technology is great whenever it works. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Paul reminds the Ephesians of what their state was before God's grace and God's mercy intervened in their lives. He tells them in verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. What is it that we really deserve in our lives? What can we claim back to God that you haven't given me enough? It's a hard one. Paul describes us as dead in our trespasses and sin. He tells us back in Romans chapter 5 that we were enemies of Christ and we were weak and we were sinners. And yet despite all of that, God has abundantly lavished upon us all the blessings in heavenly places. He has given us an option and a choice of true eternal life with him. He has given us his son, and yet whenever we grumble and complain about our life, aren't we truly expressing that what we are going through right now is undeserved? What is it that I really deserve in my life? We'll talk about that just a little bit more in a little, in a little bit. Luke chapter 7. Look over in Luke chapter 7 for a moment. And not all grumbling and complaining is exactly the same, and, and we're using broad strokes today to, to cover a lot of different things. But some of our grumblings and our complainings end up declaring we deserve better or we deserve easier in our lives. I want to look there in verse... Okay. One of those times that my handwritten notes transitioned over into text is not what I'm looking for. And I apologize. I believe it's chapter 17 in verse 10. I could be wrong about that one as well. I probably know. Chapter 17 verse 10. 
I'll, I'll deal with the secretary later. Whenever, whenever I get back home, he'll get a good nap. <laughs> Verse 10, Jesus makes the point, So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded to say, or when, when you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants, and we have only done our duty. So oftentimes we, we tend to be people who get above our station, who demand much more from God than we ever deserve. And Jesus says, when, you, when you've done all, when, whenever you have completed everything that you were commanded to do, that we still don't have the right to boast before God, and look what I deserve, look what I, I have. He says, what we need to be willing to say is we are unworthy servants and we have only done our duty. And I want us to consider Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 33. This may be an odd passage, passage to look at for this point, but I hope it makes sense. I uh, hope that you guys will give me a little leeway, just enough to hang myself with. Nehemiah is dealing with the time period of the return. So you have three re three returns up to this point, and the people are in a bad state. They've been in captivity for years. They have a small remnant, a trickle, that is coming back into Jerusalem, a city that's broken down, walls are torn apart. The, they're facing persecutions on every side. Things are not in a good state. And you can imagine at any point in time the people rising up in Nehemiah's time, gathering together, and complaining before God that we deserve better or we deserve easier. Our life should be more than it is now. And yet in Nehemiah chapter 9, the people get together not to complain to God, but to confess their sins before God. And there in verse 32 and verse 33, the people say, Now therefore our God... The great, the mighty, the awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love. Let not all the hardships seem little to you that you have come to us upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, and you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. If you want to talk about people who probably could feel like they have the short end of the straw, I would suggest the people here in Nehemiah's time probably could definitely feel that they had the short end of the straw. And what they had the mindset to say, though, is that, God, you have been here through all of it. You have acted wisely and fairly. You have dealt with us faithfully. And it's us who have acted with it. Whenever we grumble and complain, we, we claim that God has not been fair, that he hasn't acted faithful, that his loving kindness has not been lavished upon us, and we declare that we deserve better. And yet, the people of Nehemiah's time, I think, had the right mindset. God has dealt fairly, he has dealt faithfully, and it's us who have lived with him. Another problem with grumbling and complaining is that we fail to have faith that things work together for good. I don't know what all of the hardships are going to turn out to be. But in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, Paul says that we know. I love it when people who are way smarter than me tell me things that I, I don't know as if I already know them. <laughs> Paul states that in Romans chapter 8. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But we should know that. And yet, whenever I grumble and complain about what I'm currently going through, I fail to see what God is currently working in my life in order to get me where I ought to be, or where I need to be. That my, my faith is lacking in that area. That I'm, I'm the Israelite who's come to the Red Sea, where God's going to work an amazing miracle, who turns around and complains to God, why did you bring me here? This is pointless. I'm just going to die here. Or where God is going to, to give them water out of a rock. And he knows that already. And then I come up and I complain, well, you have only brought me here to drown me in having no water. Or not drown me. The opposite of drown me. <laughs> that one. Whenever we are in the midst of our hardship or our trial and we turn around and complain to God that he just doesn't know what we're going through, maybe he's exactly the one who knows what we're going through and what the purpose is behind 
We need to have more faith in those things. Whenever we grumble and complain, we fail to appreciate all the good blessings that we have. In Ephesians chapter 3, or Ephesians chapter 1 in verse 3, I should say, Paul introduces the rest of his statements by this phrase, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Christ Jesus, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What if I don't have this one particular thing or this set of things that I want in my life? Or what if I have to suffer through some things while being blessed abundantly in other areas? Is that worth grumbling and complaining over? Paul says we have been given all spiritual, or every spiritual blessing in heaven places. We have been far more abundantly blessed than we could ask or think of, and yet we want to complain and grumble about this small thing. And, and we'll pick on kids whenever they're small right now, because I'm the only one that has kids that are small right now. Doesn't it irk you whenever your kids complain about the smallest thing, whenever they have a house over their head, and they have a comfortable bed, and we have heat, and we have air conditioning, and we have water, and plenty of food on the table, and they're always clothed, and they're always full, and they always have activities to do, and yet this one small thing happened, and like the entire world ended for them, you think, well, oh, can't you just see all the good things in your life? And then we turn around and do the exact same thing to God. I, I love the irony of thinking, ah, oh, I've, I've grown up seeing how my kids act and think, I don't do that anymore. I'm, I'm so glad I've grown. And then recognizing that I do the exact same thing to God. Whenever we grumble and complain, we, we, we find the minutia of the problems in our life, and we let that block out all of the abundance of blessings that we have. Paul says we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing, and sometimes we need to meditate and think on that way more than our current spare. But it also suggests that we often fail to work as we should. Whenever I'm grumbling about this area, I don't work as I ought to. And for those who have worked jobs, how many times have you seen your coworkers do that, where you have a task to do, and all they want to do is just stand around and complain about what the foreman or the manager or what the boss said or what that one customer said or did. And whenever you find somebody who has time to complain, they usually are doing that rather than actually taking their time to do the work that they ought to do. Just as a general idea. I think the same thing kind of happens in the spirit. We often also don't serve others as humbly as we ought to. If I'm going to grumble and complain about you, then I'm probably not going to humbly serve you as I ought to whether it's brother or sister, whether it's enemy, uh, whether it's someone I don't know yet. We also often don't adorn the gospel as we must. How many people want to look at somebody who's a grumbler and a complainer and think, ah, that's the kind of life I want to lead. I want to be just like that person. I wonder what, I wonder what their secret is in life to make them so grumpy. <laughs> we don't do that. We are called to adorn the doctrine. That's what Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14, do all things without grumbling or complaining, so that you may shine as the lights in the world, that the more you grumble, the less your light shines. That goes hand in hand as well. So let's talk about some solutions. If, if someone points out problems and never gives solutions, uh, be wary of him and, and the guy who keeps doing picks. But solutions. I'll give you just a couple quick ideas this afternoon. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 17, um, he gives the broader context in chapter 7 over marriage, and he gives a smaller context in verses, uh, right around verse 17, actually dealing with whether you are uh, free or in bondage. And in both contexts, both in, in marriage and in bondage, uh, whatever connection you want to make uh, to both of those there, I'll, I'll leave you to make those connections. But in verse 17, it says, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him, and to which God has called them. And this is my rule in all the churches. There is a sense of humility and acceptance for whatever God has assigned in my life. So here are people who are struggling in their marriage. As we get into that, that middle section of chapter 7, individuals who are struggling with their lot, whether they are free 
or a bond servant. And he says, only let the person lead the life the Lord has assigned to him, into which God has called him. It's a pretty big idea, pretty big concept. To just simply humbly accept our lot. In Job chapter 1, in verse 21, I think this is probably one of the, the passages we know extremely well from Job. In verse 20, Job arose, tore his robes, shaved his head, head fell on the ground, and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. If there's anybody who's probably, probably okay complaining, in our books, it'd be Job. Here's somebody who's lost everything in one day. Chapter 2, he's going to lose his health, and by the time chapter 4 rolls around, his friends are going to turn against him. Not, let alone his wife turning against him in chapter 2 as well. You, you're wanting somebody to, who seems like grumbling and complaining is going to be an okay thing in their life, and Job's response, which makes him the man that he is, is not to grumble or complain or charge God with wrong, but it's to bow down and worship and to state, blessed be the name of the Lord. There's a pretty consistent theme that runs through most of the Old Testament for individuals who are characterized and classified as godly individuals. People are held up as examples for us that whenever they face hardships and wrongs, that they worship God. And so oftentimes we retreat from the worship of God into our own self-pity. We, we oftentimes devolve into grumbling and complaining, even if it's just internal grumbling and complaining, and we fail to be able to worship God through the hardships. As we see Job as an example, we'll, we'll look at James chapter 5 in a little bit, where James brings up this very concept when it comes to Job. But Job worshipped. Abraham worshipped. Moses worshipped. David worshipped whenever hardships happen. And the question comes up for us whenever we have hardships. Do we, is our, our natural reaction, is our predisposition to, to worship more? And I would suggest that it really should be. Titus chapter 3, since we uh, pointed this out the other day, and I had missed it for all those times, If one of the problems we see is people who tend to complain, tend to work less, then I would say that we need to dedicate ourselves to the work, regardless of what we're going through, or whatever things we might want to complain about. In verse 8, Paul writes, The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. And then he repeats this idea, in verse 14, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not to be unfruitful. You know, specifically in verse 14, here are cases of urgent need, times where we want to maybe sit around and complain and grumble about our lot. He says, you make sure that they devote themselves and then meet those urgent needs in those cases. Another solution I would suggest is to have faith in the good that God can produce. And this is where we're going to go over to into a sorry, uh, James chapter 5. <laughs> and we'll look at verses 7 down to verse 11. He says in verse 7, be patient therefore, brothers. Now, remember he opens up his letter in chapter 1 there in verse 5. He tells them, or verse 2 rather, to count, all, count it all joy, my brother, when you meet trials of various kinds. The, the audience of James is not um, a happy small congregation tucked away safely. Uh, this is, he writes the 12 tribes of the dispersion. And then the very first thing he mentions is their trials that they face. And then in chapter 5 in verse 7 he says, Be patient, therefore, 
And then you think, well, for another week, another couple days, he says, be patient until the coming of the Lord. A little bit of patience he's urging him to have. It, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider them blessed to remain steadfast. And you have heard of the steadfastness of Job. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Again, right tucked in that in there, he mentions in verse 9, do not grumble against one another. And then he encourages us here, as you get down to verse 11, to see the purpose of the Lord by using Job as an example. God had a purpose in what Job had suffered. He had a purpose in what he went through. And that purpose was not seen by Job at the beginning or the middle of what he was going through, but we can see it now. Grumbling and complaining does not serve God's purposes. Patience and endurance does. In Philippians chapter 4 would be our last passage. There in verse 7. And the Psalms, I think, are a, a great example of this. You find every emotion kind of conceivable inside of the Psalm. Joy and sorrow and heartbreak and uncertainty. Vengeance and grief and relief. All of that is found in the book of Psalms. How do we express those things clearly and fully back to God? The book of Psalms are a good point. But here in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, or starting, sorry, back in, in um, verse 5 and 6, let your reasonableness be known to everyone, the Lord's of Him. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. As in all things in our life, prayer is going to be of utmost importance. Are we allowed to express to God our heartache and our sorrow? Absolutely. Are we to grumble and complain about God to one another? Absolutely not. We tend to write off grumbling and complaining as being not a big deal and not a huge issue. We tend to think of it as just expressing ourselves or getting things off our chest you know, or, or just venting our emotions to one another. And yet the mindsets that leads to grumbling and complaining are a big problem. A lack of faith in God, a lack of trust in his purposes, uh, a misalignment of our sights on things that are good and picking up the minutiae details of problems in order to make them huge issues. The list kind of goes on and on. I, we gave just some of the problems for grumbling and complaining. I want us to consider the solutions of our, you know, for these problems for us to be people who truly dedicate ourselves to the work. We find again, you know, just in our common everyday place, that you find there are coworkers that we have that grumble and complain and don't do a whole lot of work. And we have people who dedicate themselves to the work, even though they're going through the same thing that the grumble or the complainer is going through, and if they go home satisfied and sleep well at night, I find the same thing to be so spiritual. We all have things that we could grumble and complain about. And we could be Christians who stand off on the sideline and grumble and complain about all the things that happen in life. Or we could be people who truly put our hands to the plow and work hard. I would suggest that. I would suggest we people be people who have faith that God can produce good in the bad that we're currently going through. That there is a purpose that God has in those things. And that in all things we express to God the things we need to express to God. But not to complain about God to other people. So as we go back to where we had started there in Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. I want us to take some time this week to, to consider our idle chat with other people. 
This last year has been unusual. <laughs> this last year has been hard. I think we are coming up to almost exactly one year since everything seems to have gone sideways. And the last year, how much have we complained about what God has chosen to do for us? How much have we complained about what we haven't got to do or all the things that we wanted to do that you know had to be postponed for another time? How much have we complained about how the world has changed or what has happened politically over the last year? Ask yourself if your light has been dimmed through the things you have said over the last 12 months, or has it shown forth brighter over the things you have said over the last 12 months? We've all had a, been we've all been in the same storm, whether we're in the same boat or not. We've all gone through similar things the last couple of months. How has your speech shown forth God's glory in the last 12 months? Has it been tainted by grumbling and complaining, or has it been filled with praise and honor? Take some time this week and to really consider what have you used your tongue for, recognizing that grumbling and complaining is a big problem. Jake has picked out the song of invitation for us. There is something that we can hopefully never grumble and complain about, and that's the hope of eternal security. That God has poured forth on us more blessings than we could ever ask or thought of. 